protesters in Iraq stormed the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. That was on Tuesday. The new year brought a second day of demonstrations at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Protesters set fire to a gate but did not breach the compound. American troops fired tear gas in response. The second day of protests comes in response to U.S. airstrikes on five targets in Iraq and Syria. The U.S. says the targeted areas were controlled by an Iranian-backed militia known as al-Hash al-Shabi and blamed for attacks on joint U.S.-Iraqi military facilities. The militia denies involvement. Iraqi officials say those strikes killed at least 25 and wounded dozens more. The American troops in Iraq are supposed to either train Iraqi forces or to combat terrorism, but the killing of members of the al-Hashad al-Shabi, this is something unacceptable. So for this reason, we are coming here until the U.S. troops leave Iraq. Then how did a group of protesters get inside the U.S. embassy and cause so much havoc on Tuesday? Well, the first question, how they got into the green zone, a zone which is patrolled not just by uh, U.S. officials, U.S. contractors, but also the Iraqi government. This is right. an area that even during the heat of our occupation in Iraq was nearly impenetrable from oh, militias and terrorists. Is, 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 a, is the, the, the U.S. embassy in Baghdad, is it kind of like they're along this main street? where you just get out of your vehicle and you walk up, knock on the door of the embassy? Oh no, it's, it's segmented inside a, a protective bubble inside Baghdad, which to even get to this, you have to get into what's called the green zone. So what's the green zone? The green zone is a safety buffer. It has checkpoints. It has uh, Iraqi uh, military, U.S. military contractors protecting the roads, uh, checking IDs, checking uh, uh, any armaments, any kind of uh, security threat is stopped. Usually, unless they do you have go any idea how, how much distance, how much space I think in the green? To, about 10 miles worth around 10 the, miles? 10 miles worth. It's a, an entire bubble around uh, the, uh, the embassy and other key buildings in the center of Baghdad. So, so uh, how were all these individuals able to get past these checkpoints at the green zone then? At Iraq, ballooned over 16,000 staff during the Iraq war. The embassy building was built in the green zone, a highly fortified area along the Tigris River in Baghdad. This area, guarded by soldiers and walls more than 9 feet or 3 meters tall, was and still is home to much of the international presence in Baghdad. That included embassies of countries like the US, UK, and Australia, but also some companies. War is big business, and the Green Zone was home to small field headquarters for many large international engineering, construction, and private military firms contracted to help in the war. That is to say, the Green Zone was primarily home to a large group of civilians working in Iraq, which is why it was so heavily guarded. Given the security threat, the U.S. Embassy there was built to be entirely self-sufficient. It has its own generators, its own wells, its own water filtration plant, its own sewage plant, its own fire station, it even has its own internet uplink to circumvent the Iraqi network. It has its own phone network, both wired and wireless, which both operate pretty much as if they were in the U.S. They use the area codes of New York and Virginia. Uh, individuals plus Iraqi politicians, because uh, the, the word right now is that they were let in. That there was a coordinated stand down of sorts where the Iraqi contingent, the police and military, did not stop this crowd. If not anything, they allowed them to use the main roads to the embassy. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's, where I, that's where I see this going. They right. were allowed in. Right. This, to me, Doc, looks like a, <laughs> a staged event, staged by the U.S. government for the optics, for the world to see. Oh, another Benghazi. Look at this. Or and even throwing us back to the Iran, you know, you know, hostage crisis yes. back in the 70s. I mean, that still is in the American psyche to this day. When I heard this, Doc, uh, First, in the morning on Tuesday, that my first thought was, there's no way this crowd got that deep into that compound. Without being fired upon, without being uh, contacted. Let's say they, they, uh, the military claimed they used stun grenades, these other things, but they got all the way up to the reception area. They set part of the MC on fire. Inside. Yes. They got inside the building. Right. So you've got uh, these ideas here from our history. You've got uh, the... Uh, the hostage crisis from the 70s, you've got the memories of Benghazi, and so now you've got this idea, we're not going to let another embassy fall, we're not going to let another embassy go down. And you notice too, Rick, that they use the word of the uh, these individuals that attacked the embassy, 
a called them militia. Now, when I when I say the word militia, what images come to your mind? What when I when I use that word militia, what do you imagine? Well, here in the United States, all right, I mean, I know what the historical right uh, definition of a militia is: uh, patriots defending okay. the country. Right. So, uh, but when you think of militia as far as anywhere else in the world, what do you picture them doing? They're at least they armed. Have? They have weapons, right? Right. They're, they probably have guns, right? And they, you know, they have uniforms. They have helmets and things <laughs> like that. Where were all the firearms at? Where were all the guns at? I saw them throwing, you know, Molotov cocktails. I saw them throwing rocks. I saw them using battering rams. Maybe they have gun control in Iraq. And so, um, I see all US these. Weapons. I see all these things. I didn't see a militia there that day. Now, this is not an unpopular opinion at all out here today, Rick. Maybe they were crisis actors. Why are you staring at me? Well, it's, it's, no. it's definitely possible. You look at this. John Bolton, before his, his uh, surreptitious exit from the National Security Council, uh, he made a big stink about two separate mortar attacks at that Iraqi embassy. The other thing that was raised and, and really got no attention, the Jerusalem Post reported that there was a, a rogue Iraqi member of parliament who's claiming that that embassy, the fortified uh, you know, embassy, the fortress uh, with a green zone protecting it, was being used by Mossad and ISIS for suspicious intelligence activity. Well, we look at the current uh, state right now. This all stems from an alleged missile attack on a U.S. base uh, n near Kirkuk. That's actually where I was deployed. I know the area very well. Uh, the Iranian forces, well, they're claiming they are, the Popular Mobilization Unit, or forces as they're being reported by the military and, and the, by the, the U.S. press, this group is nowhere near that base. It, it, if anything, ISIS uh, continues, according to official reports, are closest to this place. But this is what has stemmed the, uh, the essential, uh, I guess, response by the U.S. Uh, they, they conducted a couple airstrikes after this missile attack. And that's what essentially led to this militia group of politicians, unarmed individuals, but uh, with the strength and the clearance to go all the way up to the most protected site in Iraq to wage uh, basically havoc for a couple days. The U.S. action was described as, quote, precision defensive airstrikes in response to a rocket attack last week that killed one American contractor. The U.S. says an Iranian-backed militia launched that attack. The Pentagon is moving more troops into the area, but U.S. President Donald Trump says he doesn't want a war with Iran. I don't think that would be a good idea for Iran. It wouldn't last very long. And do I want to? No. I want to have peace. I like peace. And... Iran should want peace more than anybody. So I don't see that happening. No, I don't think Iran would want that to happen. It would go very quickly. Iran's supreme leader denied his country was coordinating protests at the embassy. Some people say we are heading to war. No, we are not taking the country towards war. Uh, unbelievable story. I want to put up on the screen, this is number seven. Uh, from Reuters, protesters burn security post at U.S. Embassy in Iraq, sending more troops to the region. Now look at look at that scene. There's a an Apache, an Apache helicopter. What's happening there? What's, what's the Apache doing? It's dropping off some flares, and uh, the idea was to uh, intimidate the crowd, to let them know that a, a gunship, something that which could kill that entire crowd if need be, but well, it's great. Makes a great photo. It sure does. And was Reuters there? They had uh, I reporters, know. I believe, in the city. But you're well, right. They, I they mean, Reuters has, has a picture. We got that from Reuters. Did, was Reuters there to capture that picture? I believe they have footage from a local affiliate there. So they, they got that, and that's all you heard. You saw Apache gunships, a video of the Apache gunships, and militia burning the embassy. Okay, I'm going to walk our, our viewers through a sequence of uh, stories. So keep that picture in mind, all right? More troops on their way to the Middle East, okay? So let me pick this up here. Let's go back, all right, this is number eight, and this is October 13, 2019. You'll remember this from last fall. Trump tells Pentagon to begin withdrawing remaining troops from northern Syria. That's October 13, 2019. Let's go to the next one, number nine. October 19, 2019. 
all U.S. troops withdrawing from Syria expected to go to Western Iraq, says the Pentagon chief. Mr. Esper there. So. so they didn't come home to America. No. They went to the next war. Yes. And where is that? Iraq, Western Iraq. And we said it back in October. Yes. We said it. We said they're being redeployed for the next war. Yes. So now we'll go to number, uh, number 10. This is Ynet News from Israel. This is an opinion piece. Iran at war could be good for Israel. Now this, this article, just, this just came out uh, today or yesterday. A couple days ago, yes. Yeah. It's from Ynet News in Israel. And the writer is saying, if Iran could be pulled into a war with America, that would be good for Israel. Right. The possibility that Iran will drag Israel in a developing military conflict with the United States presents an opportunity for Jerusalem. An opportunity. An opportunity. We'll never let any good opportunity, opportunity, good opportunity pass you by when you could start a war. OK, the next article. Well, that was said by Rahm Emanuel, right? The man yeah. who's uh, never let a crisis. His grandfather. His grandfather. Was through within, no, his gang. father. His, his father, father was father in the Stern, Stern gang. gang. Yeah, he said never let a crisis, you know, pass go to by. Waste. Yeah, go to waste. Uh, so the next one, number 11, this is Haratz. This is an opinion piece written by a Jewish writer. Netanyahu should not be allowed to start a war with Iran to save himself. Okay, is that an anti-Semitic article in that Jewish newspaper? I'm reading it. I will be accused of it. But it's a Jewish writer in Haratz saying Netanyahu should not be allowed to start a war with Iran to save himself. So obviously there are concerns in Israel right now that there are people there that are worried that Benjamin Netanyahu could take Israel into war in an effort to win the election. Well, anyways, there are people in Israel that are concerned They're alleging about there's a yes. conspiracy, that there's a conspiracy and there, and there's to start a war. Here, Right yes. now in Vero Beach, Florida, that also are concerned. So I'm that. in agreement with that Jewish writer in Haratz. Yes, I agree with you. Don't let Netanyahu start a war with Iran, because if Iran is pulled into a war with the United States, that's good for Israel. And it's good for Netanyahu's political career. He'll hang on to power. We're not the only ones seeing it. People in Israel are seeing it and saying it. And you speculated what, what was written on this application to the, the uh, Supreme Court of Israel. Well, part of uh, Netanyahu's speeches over the course of uh, the Christmas break and even, even in the new year here has been that he is the only hope for Israel. He, he's the only one that has experience to weather a conflict, a, another intifada, or even, uh, dare I say, another regional war, if not potentially a nuclear war. Because we're speaking about Iran. They have done nuclear tests. They have probably the capability to strike <laughs> Jerusalem with cruise missiles. And that's not even talking about the sleeper cells that they reportedly have in the vicinity of Jerusalem and in the United States. Because they've been preparing for this war for the last 30 years. Abandon your fantasy of destroying Israel. Abandon the fantasy that you will conquer Jerusalem. The Iranian drone was shot down. It's got a wing here, fixed wing here. So this was an Iranian drone sent over Golan Heights. Right. You shot it down with a F-16. Right. They then sent missiles and artillery to attack right. you and Golan Heights, and then you. Right. So this was the start of everything. Right that was here. it. That was this it. Was and you beginning. see it. The center was blown up by our uh, by our interception. About 10 days after 9/11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, "Sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, "Well, you're too busy." He said, "No, no." He says, "We've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq." This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, "We're going to war with Iraq. Why?" He said, "I don't know." <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. 
And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Well, if you're... <laughs> If that's the headline you see constantly reappearing, war with Iran, if, if you're a leader in the Iranian government, you're going to say, we got to get ready. Yes. we got to hold this off as long as we can, but we have to get ready. The same as the Russians are th thinking the same thing, that they have to prepare and yet try to hold off the war as long as possible. Uh, one, one piece of information is interesting. The, the point man, the, the man who led um, this um, In incursion, the storming. Yes, the man who stormed the U.S. embassy in Baghdad and, re and encountered no resistance from U.S. troops until he got inside the, the, the reception area. What does that say about our, our military protection? That's a good question, Rick. All right, what does that say about the state of readiness? If the U.S. troops guarding the U.S compound, this fortress in Baghdad. It's U.S. soil. Well, it's considered U.S. Yeah, soil. Diplomatically, it. yeah, because it's, it's an embassy. If, if U.S. troops allowed a mob to penetrate that deep into a U.S. embassy, what does that say about our state of readiness? And in, in addition to that, too, Rick, there was supposed to be Iraqi defense forces around the embassy, too, trained by the U.S. military to protect the outside of the embassy. Where were they at? Did they all run and hide when the protesters showed up? It's, it's, or were they helping protest? Now this is a false flag operation. It's a false flag operation. They allowed it to happen. It was staged to happen. And it's about starting a war with Iran. Why? Because Israel wants it. Netanyahu needs it. And let's be honest, President Trump it would help him if we could change the headlines. And the war machine needs it. And the war machine needs it. So this, uh, this gentleman... Um, Hadi al-Amiri. Yes, who is this? Uh, he's actually the former transportation minister, so he knew the roads of, pretty well. Of Iraq. Of Iraq. So, so he, he knows knew, the highways. He knew, he knew the highways. Well, he is now the uh, pseudo leader of the Poplar Mobilization Unit, the, uh, what is being called the leader, the, the man who organized this storming of the U.S. Embassy in Iraq. But it just so happens that he also knows another capital really well because he was part of the Iraqi delegation to the United States in December of 2011 and was invited into the Obama White House. He's actually in the same room as Barack Hussein Obama while he was speaking, discussing uh, security issues, actually the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq with the U.S. president. We have this story from Daily Mail on London, and uh, we'll put this up on the screen. Uh, Barack Obama welcomed leader of U.S. embassy attack to the White House, Iran's point man in Baghdad, Hadi al-Amari, al this is, I actually went pull B-roll of this, oh, Rick. Look at this. Look at that, that's him right there. The man in the, the blue tie, that's him. That's the mastermind of the storming of the Iraqi embassy over Christmas. Well, then the uh, Secret Service didn't do a very good job in protecting President Obama. Well, he was, wasn't considered a terrorist then, I, by the official logic of the deep state. He wasn't maybe, considered a terrorist. Maybe he was just considered a crisis actor for the United States. A good agent, good asset, like Ghislaine and uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Right. And Saddam Hussein and, um, you know, all the other people that the U.S. government has used for its purposes. Well, the, the organization that he runs, the militia, is actually part of the Iraqi military. That's the other part that's confounding here is the, the popular mobilization unit. Then the, the Pentagon has armed them. Yes, exactly. They are part of the Iraqi military. It's, it's a great business to be in, isn't it? But, but Secretary Pompeo said... Other governments should be responsible, right? responsible for whom they're giving guns to. Right. That's great should advice. We, I wish the United States would we take it. also. <laughs> and Israel. I mean, Operation Good Neighbor. We haven't been a good neighbor, nor has Israel, to Syria. Well, I, I think our audience gets the point. Well, I, I love this uh, 
paragraph in this article from the Daily Mail, Rick. It says, the ease with which Amari and these other commanders breeze through the heavily fortified green zone has alarmed U.S. officials. Really? It's alarmed you? They were allowed in. Of course they were. Made for great headlines, great and propaganda. If, and if they were not allowed in, heads should roll. Yes, firings. Heads should roll for a lack of security. Why isn't anybody, anybody being held accountable at the Pentagon? Yeah, I thought we conquered Iraq. Didn't, didn't we win Iraq or something in, in a war? I mean, didn't we beat Saddam Hussein? I don't think didn't the we Iraqis, beat everybody else? I don't think the Iraqis think that they were conquered. It doesn't act to me like they do. I mean, well, they, don't, don't they appreciate our, us as benefactors of their nation? Didn't we give them democracy and freedom and McDonald's and everything? I don't think they're happy with the U.S. being there, but they can't get rid of us, just like the Syrians don't want us in their country, but they can't get rid of us. That's right. But we sure can get rid of their oil. Perhaps you can understand why Israel is not joining you in celebrating this deal. Well, let's talk about, uh, Cynthia, there are uh, many reports uh, that talks about the influence of the uh, Israeli lobby, APAC, on United States politics in general. Well, every candidate for Congress at that time had a pledge. They were given a pledge to, to sign. And I was uh, new on the scene. And uh, so the pledge had Jerusalem as the capital city, uh, the military superiority of Israel. American Congress people have to sign this pledge. Yes, you sign the pledge. If you don't sign the pledge, you don't get money. I would get a call and uh, the person on the other end of the phone would say, I want to do a fundraiser for you. And then we would get into the planning. I would get really excited because, of course, you have to have money in order to run a campaign. And then two weeks, three weeks into the planning, they would say, did you sign the pledge? And then I would say, no, I didn't sign the pledge. And then my fundraiser would go kaput. Based on, based on every statement I've heard out of any Republican in the last two years, the Israelis are controlling our government. Not the State Department. I know now what a Zionist is. I'm saddened when I hear people say they are afraid. Afraid of what? Knowing that your government has been hijacked and that those in charge will lie to you, such knowledge should actually set us free to do what we must to maintain our own dignity. I remember what the Israeli Prime Minister said. He said, we're all Israelis now. I agree that terrorism is a problem, and I know who the terrorists are. Dick Cheney told us to expect war for the next generation and drew up a list of 60 target countries. General Wesley Clark informed us of Pentagon plans to go to war against seven countries in five years. Iraq, Sudan, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran. Syria is in process, and only Lebanon and Iran are left standing. But I'm sure their turn will come soon, too. General Wesley Clark called it a policy coup. He said that there had been a policy coup inside the United States. The U.S. media would have you believe that the U.S. is divided. None white versus white. Christian versus Muslim. The meme of division is developed by those who write the scripts in order to pit us against each other. Directly and indirectly, America's so-called special relationship with Israel has also generated unprecedented distrust fear and loathing of the United States around the world. By supporting Israel and its policies, the United States betrays not only its own national interests, but the principles it claims to embody and defend. I'm deeply ashamed of America's leadership. Uh, I look at the politicians that are leading America now, and I believe they're completely owned by internationalists uh, with a Zionist agenda. Uh, there's no humanitarian coming from our leadership. Uh, they have total disregard for the United States Constitution, uh, and it's just creating tr tremendous uh, hardship throughout the world now. And we need to do what we can in the immediate uh, future 
to stand for our national sovereignties and the rights of the people and do everything we can to remove the power of these banker elites and uh, their extensive networks, which do, in fact, control the uh, American mainstream media and most of our politicians. Uh, I want to thank you, Democrats and Republicans, for your common support for Israel, year after year, decade after decade. 